For over three centuries, Hinckley has been a hosiery town. From the first stocking knitting frame, set up by William Eliff in the 17th century, grew small workshops and eventually factories, until by the end of the 19th century, the streets of Hinckley were packed with hosiery firms. Generations of Hinckley people have worked in the industry, in firms such as Atkins, Bennett's, Flew, Jennings and many more. This film has been made to provoke memories of the working life of the town. But when I started work, I was only 13 years old. Yeah. And I started at a, a factory. Well, I started work at the age of 14. My father got me this job at Moore and Osmond's in Druid Street. I was doing, running about in the warehouse. You know, when I first started, you yeah. had to cut ribbons for the vests when I first started. And then um, after 12 months, I had to go on a, what they call a pickering machine. And it's done fancy edge, like, you know. Well, uh, uh, no, uh, turns. Mm. They had these Excel machines yeah. which made the RFOs for the army. I got a job, or someone, probably the mother, got me the job. And uh, there were certain operations you had to learn how to do. Because you were a little while learning me at the time, you know, about 12 months, and I think I had two. I couldn't quite remember, but it was two or three, I think he gave me two at the first. And uh, that's when I tell you then, I remember just after a long time, when mm. we made these, we had these O's. Yeah. I can remember that ever so well. They didn't do it, they weren't on them a long time, they made no. so many. Long black mm. cotton, horrible cotton. Yeah. With a white top and toe, and there was a, you know, there was a workhouse in England, you know. Yeah. Big, horrible big place down London. Yeah. I really fancied working the machines as a knitter and that's uh, what happened in the end that uh, when I went to Walman mm -hmm. I did go to learn the knitting on these particular machines mm -hmm. um, I'd been to Burbage with a friend they had some of these um, the Wii U machines we call them yeah. Stubbies. Stubbies yeah and uh, he learnt me these machines at Burbage at night, a chap named Alan Hunt. Of course, he was showing me how to mechanical me in a way. I didn't realise that at the time, you know, like boiling the cylinders in uh, soda, you know, to clean them uh, and that sort of thing. So when I got to Walman's, they had some of these machines. Yeah, and they were the stibbies. Yes, but they were a bearded needle. They weren't the latch needle. You had a presser at the back of each bed that pressed uh, the bed in to keep the yarn under. And uh, then they to be released at a certain time. Mm. Um, so I got so interested in this and mm -hmm. got to Warman's, as I say. And I happened to mention one day, oh, you got them machines there, blame me, I, I mm -hmm. can work them. And from talking to the management, I um, must have impressed him <laughs> for some reason or other. So then I went on uh, being trained as a trainee mechanic. And, that's that. mm. and then they let us on to the flat locking. Not like they do it today, they put them straight on the machines, yeah. but then you had to work up to it. Yeah. Was the flat locking a difficult job or...? Yes, it's one of the hardest jobs. Yeah? Yeah. Flat locking's dying out a bit now though. Even there, they're doing small jumpers and things now. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the flat locking? What type of garments would you have done? First, it had got um, nine threads. It had got four yarns, four cottons, and one silk thread and the, the four yarns and cotton sewed a straight seam and then the silk thread wove itself in and out of it. That was a flat lock. Oh. Torres came in 
from when Paul Fashion went out, I went to the warehouse for a bit of folding and bagging, of putting in of stockings, putting in the bags ready to go out to the shops. Well, for those ones again, what do you machine is? So they came round to me and said, uh, would I uh, go back on a machine? Well, I mean, I'll always like machines better than anything else. So I uh, went back on the machines. Then I was a uh, tight set of the locker. And um, after that, I went through different phases again of different work, you know, of experimenting how to do. And then uh, they brought in, over the years, like, they gradually brought in um, different denies and qualities of work. But also they brought in big machines that could then cut out o overlocking. They're like the tractories and things like that. But there's different uh, big machines that could do, actually do the cut and sew the tights. The Martin Martin's really went to see how the digital would round at the Forge Tower. But then, but at that time, they could only do the one sizes, any larger sizes they couldn't do. So for larger sizes, the gussets, they put like gussets in. So I became a gusset overlocker then. <laughs> I took till I retired. Mm -hmm. I used to come up and do uh, other the jobs. You know, sometimes they want someone to put in seams up circular legs. Yeah. When they wanted a skill machine, they started other things. I've done other things, you know. Yeah. Uh, but also they did circular gussets in machines, but then they also got a machine out that did that. So then I went on the big full panel gusset, you see, that made extra right up to about 56 of them, something like this. And now I was on that right up till I retired. I went on the mending. I chose the mending. Yeah. I thought, I don't think I should fancy a machine. I know what a mender all my life. Yeah, will you yeah. mend it? Would you amend it? Yes. Doris was a sheep. Mm -hmm. You used to get a dozen stockings and on your lap and you'd put your hand up and You'd, you could go out and look here and look here. If you found a lot of holes, yeah. that slowed your money down. But if you worked at a good place where they made good work, mm -hmm. and you didn't come across any else, weren't it there? Yeah. If you worked at a good place, but if you worked and you got a lot of rubbish in work, you didn't earn so much, didn't you? Oh, no. It was like my job, account. But when you was on your, you went on your own time, and you wouldn't have done an apprenticeship. I were a bit swift, they said I were a bit swift, <laughs> so uh, I think that helped me a little bit. The lady would turn these socks, they'd be stitched at the toe, and the lady would turn them back, they'd be steamed uh, with the presses, there were three big presses, very old fashioned, with the balls on each end and they swung round the to close the the press, yeah. yes, or footballs, and I yeah. told you that the chap who operated them used to sweat a bit. He used to uh, have his beer under the counter, yes, from a Nelson, yeah. and yeah. he'd be across the Nelson at the break time, and with a pint, and, uh, and bring some more back. For a she used to turn these socks back, and you know it used to make her arms awful rough. From St. Kinson and Emery's I went to Hood and Mason's mm. in the trim shop where they used to pull stockings on board. So I was known as a legger, a lad, and you uh, had to join the union to get a job in there, but mm. the pay rates were so much better. Mm. I went on to about 15 shillings. Yes, but it was a, it was a hard job. Mm -hmm. It was one of the hardest jobs. Not physically doing it at the time, like digging. Mm -hmm. but it was a hard job in as much as the temperature you worked in, the mm -hmm. speed you had to work at, and the application you had to mm -hmm. apply because you couldn't, again, you were paid by piece rate by the hundred mm. dozen or part of a hundred dozen. And if you didn't get through the work, mm. nobody bothered you, you just didn't get paid. I always claim that we died the first 
pass black on nylon stocking. There was a lot of competition going on as to how to produce uh, a black. I'd got the idea that logwood, a logwood black, hematin black, was going to be the thing, you mm -hmm. see, but it had, it had to be uh, diacetized and developed chemically, which wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, I talked to this, over this with a chemist mm -hmm. in Leeds, who was the Yorkshire Dye and Chemical Company. He was the chief chemist there. I got to know these people, you see, and they me. He said, I'd love to come down and help you with this, you see. Mm -hmm. The countering of women's stockings was a male preserve. But we had the Countermen's Associate, Hinkley District Countermen's Association in those days, purely Hinkley Trade Union, and only men could work on the counter, mm -hmm. pairing and folding women's stockings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, we managed to break that down because we went to the, the Industrial Court in London and got the right to employ females. We were into lots of places, seaside. They took us to Black, went to Blackpool, went to Stanton. That was Mr. Frank called yeah. us. We used to have some fun on the outings. Took us to a nice meal. Raised a nice meal when we were there, you know. We used to save at work years ago, half a crown a week. It used to be a man saved yeah. it for you. Got six pounds, you see. Yeah. And that'd take you on the holidays, your six pounds, yeah. you see. But I don't think you'll get long term workers now like you used to do. Remember as well, we finished school up when we were 14. Yeah. You haven't got this extra higher education you've got now where you did so many other things. See, I went through the war years that controlled a lot of my education, as you might say. For one thing, you used to have to have days off from work to go into the fields to pick potatoes because you were doing lab work, yeah, you see. Days off from school. From school to yeah. do lab work, you see. So therefore, you missed out on education. Yeah. I fair finished fifth on the top of my school. Mm -hmm. and I, was, I was considered quite clever. Yeah. But I wasn't able to, and I couldn't afford, because you had to pay if you went to grammar school in those yeah. days. And my parents could afford that. So therefore, and it was like coming to the Tenham College to even learn, you could not afford to pay that money out to come. So therefore, you landed in these mundane jobs and you stuck to them at the beach because you were told to. In the old days, you got a lot of friendliness of other people, you know, camaraderie. For one thing, when you uh, finished off work, you'd have a lot of uh, people come from and places like that, so you've got the actual patches laid on buses to take you home. Yeah. So therefore, you'd all, they'd all group together, get on the buses together, so the factory continued on, even from out of work. But well, now, cars and all like that, people just get in cars and go off. So it doesn't carry on the same. You know, are you following me, what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is the friendship carried on outside the factory? as well as in. And that's not the same these days because the minute you're off each work, everybody just goes, goes all their own way. I want yeah. to get left but they get dropped off and it's finished, you know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't get the chance of carrying on like it used to do years ago. There was a more of a, uh, a case of years ago as well that you all stuck together more to survive. But well, nowadays there's not that. There's just not that in the factory these days. Do you think that's got anything to do with the fact of looking back at things and things always look nice and uh... No, no, no. I wouldn't say, do we don't get me wrong. When they say things look nice, in fact, things were much harder in those days. The conditions of work weren't the same as what they are today. Mm -hmm. You've got no sick relief if you're poor or anything like that. You've got no canteens. You didn't have a canteen? Oh, no, you've got no, no. canteens. You've got nothing like that. No. Uh, you've got your own kettle. You used to just go and fill it, come back and sit down, and you carry on working. You didn't start for a cup of tea or anything like that. So you didn't have, say, break in the morning? Oh, no, you've got no break. You just carry straight through. You've worked straight through. What about dinner time? Oh, you'd have uh, your hour or so dinner or whatever, yeah. then come back and work straight through. But, or oh, some factories did people like that, you've got to admit, you're not you're supposed to do, but they didn't. And then you carried on, because people wanted the money that you had back, you see, you carried on working. The conditions of that in factories have improved greatly since then. I mean, safety, you see, 
me when I was at dinner just with the Johnson, so I was sitting there and working and I looked up and I suddenly saw flames shooting out of pipes as I sat there working. Well that was all the dust that accumulated on the pipes, the cotton from the yard and all like that and I shouted fire! Well nobody kind of got up and ran up, we all sat there working while the mechanic climbed up and knocked the, pipe, the flames off the pipes. You know, I mean, that as it may sound, it was like that. You see, it's a different world. Oh yes, in 1947, it was a very hard winter and everything came to a stop because we just couldn't get through. And I remember on the, uh, about the day or so before, we had, everything had to stop. It was all over the country it stopped. And I remember going to work, I was knee deep in snow. When we finished work, it had been snowy in the house. We still had to work through to six. And when we came out of work, it was that deep, it was nearly up to our waist in parts with the drifts. And uh, I had to walk, because I was always a tall person. I had to walk from right up inside the town where it was, down to the bus station to make a path for the other girls who were going down to the bus station to catch the bus, because they, could, they couldn't get through to catch the bus, you see. And then they had to, when they get there, the bus had to turn up to take them home. You know what I mean? It was like that. And um, you see, the bus this town came to a full stop for about, I don't know, several days. But for one thing, they hadn't got road clears out for those days like they've got now. You've never got gritters or anything like that. It's oh, entirely different. It's a different world, really, these days. It's luxury, really, yeah. to what it was in those days. And I think that's what brought the people together. Well, the hardships, really, not the good times. It was the hardships. And they made their own good times to brighten up everything else. Is that bringing it to you now how it was? Yes. It wasn't easier then. It was a darn sight harder, mm. really, if people these days only realised. Much harder. Oh yes, you, you talk to one another, you, you didn't stop work, you, you just shouted across to one another. In fact, you got as well, you could live with one another because the noise was so terrific. And you got a lot of noise that you just learned to live with, really, mm -hmm. as much as anything else. Yeah. And you gradually got to know everybody and everybody's problems. Yeah. But nowadays, you'd get somebody who got dead at the back of you and you wouldn't even notice you, but that nose down, you know what I mean? Not just exaggerating, but you realise what I mean. But uh, you know everybody's problems. And, you would uh, give your opinions and even lend the help in how you can.